I am Ryan Inklum. I am talking about uh, Grunt. Uh, so as I just said, uh, I'm Ryan Inklum. I'm a front end engineer at Northwestern Mutual uh, for about three more days only. <laughs> After that, I'm going to be moving on to Netflix. So I'm going to join going to California. That said, I am going to miss you guys. I've had a, a great time at the Milwaukee JavaScript user group. Uh, met a lot of cool people. Uh, we had a lot of great presentations while I've been here. So I'm going to miss you, but I will not uh, vanish. I'll probably be back and poke my head every once in a while. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> uh, I am a lover of all things open source. And I am Bittershit Ryan pretty much anywhere on the internet. So Twitter, GitHub, Stack Overflow, anywhere. If you like JavaScript tweets, follow me. I tweet pretty much exclusively about JavaScript. And I complain just like everyone else. All right, so before we get started, a few questions. So who in here currently uses Grunt? Only a few hands, good. All right, so if you don't use Grunt, uh, do you guys test your JavaScript? Raise your hand and test it. Okay, good on you. Shame on you guys that don't. Um, so you combine who combines and minifies a JavaScript? Good. Who links their JavaScript? Awesome. All right, who uses pre-compiled languages like Less and CoffeeScript? Right, you guys are hipsters, but that's okay. We still like you. <laughs> all right, so Grunt. That's where Grunt comes in. It does all of these things for you. All right, it's a JavaScript task runner. So Grunt runs on top of Node, so you got to have Node installed to be able to run Grunt. Um, it relies very heavily on plugins. So without plugins, Grunt really doesn't do a whole lot. It's got a really robust plugin ecosystem, though. Um, there's a plugin for just about anything you can imagine. All the things I just said and, and a lot more. So some of the uh, some examples are unit tests, preprocessors, hinting, linting, file ma manipulation, and file watching. And it does so much more. So before we get started and talk a little about Grunt, let's see how to install Grunt. Uh, one thing that's important to note about Grunt is actually there are two parts to it. Um, the first part is your command line interface. And that's installed globally, so um, any project can run the command line interface. But each project itself needs a Grunt task runner installed locally as well. So to install the CLI, it's as simple as npm install-g, which means you're going to install it globally, uh, grunt-cli. And to install the local grunt, you need to go into your project's root folder, and you can do npm install grunt. And that's going to install your local instance of grunt for your project. So once you have your grunt installed, you need to configure it. Otherwise, it doesn't do a whole lot of things. So to configure Grunt for your project, uh, the first thing you're going to do is create a package.json file. Then you're going to install your plugins. Then you're going to create your Grunt file.js to configure Grunt for your particular project. So the package.json file, it isn't actually a Grunt file. It's a node.js file. Um, but it's very useful inside Grunt configurations. Um, it includes things like your project name and your current version number. Um, and more importantly, it, ins it has a list of all your Grunt dependencies. So all your plugins are in this package.json, which means you don't have to check in all of your NPM modules or all of your um, plugins. Uh, the next person that gets your project can get it. If your package.json is up to date, they can just type in NPM install, and they'll get all the plugins downloaded for them. So here's an example of a package.json file. Um, it has a project name. And it's important to note that the project name itself can have spaces in it. Um, it will fail if there's spaces in the project name. Uh, it has a version number, a description, and then these dev dependencies here are actually where your Grunt plugins are going to go. So here we just have a dependency of Grunt, uh, so this project really isn't going to do much. But like I said, without plugins, Grunt really doesn't do a whole lot. So plugins are what Grunt uses to actually do stuff, to run tasks. Um, the plugins are listed in a global registry called uh, on the GruntJS website. So gruntjs.com slash plugins will give you a list of all of the plugins. Um, and it's important to note that the contrib plugins, so you'll see like grunt-contrib-plugin name, those are the official plugins, and those are maintained by the um, GruntJS core team. 
So if there's a choice between a plugin that's a contrib plugin and a non-contrib, I'm always going to use a contrib, a contrib plugin um, because I know it's been maintained by the core team and they're going to actively support that plugin. So plugins are installed uh, with the npm install command. So here I'm just installing the uglify plugin by doing npm install uh, grunt contrib uglify and then after that I have dash dash save dev. And that's an important part. Because what save dev does is actually going to modify your package.json file and add that plugin to it. So if you would use that save dev, and the next person would download your project and have npm install, and they wouldn't get all the plugins they need to run run. And they'd be getting errors and they weren't going to be sure why. So when I talk about plugins, I always talk about the watch plugin. Because I highly recommend this plugin. It is the awesomest plugin I've used. Um, what it's going to do is run tasks when files change. So if you have less or handlebars templates that you want to pre-compile, you run watch on those directories. And when you change a handlebars template, it's going to compile it for you automatically. You don't have to run any command. You don't have to be, you know, know that you're actually trying to compile these templates. Or, yeah, templates. They'll just automatically compile. And what also is really awesome about the uh, watch plugin is the latest version includes live reload. So if you have the live reload plugin on your browser, it's going to actually um, compile your less files, compile a copy strip, whatever you want, and actually refresh your browser after those plugins or all those compilations have happened. So you're actually doing live development um, with less or some pre-compiled language, and your browser is automatically refreshing. You can run your unit tests for you. You can link your JavaScript. You can do a swipe thing. So every project I have, this is probably one of the first plugins I install. So the grunt file.js is your grunt configuration file. So each project needs a grunt configuration. So the grunt file.js will live in the root of your direct or your project, so the root directory of your project. And when you run grunt command, it's actually going to look for this or whatever directory you run your grunt. Whatever directory you're running grunt from, it's going to look for the grunt file. So the, your grunt configuration is actually where you're going to define the tasks you want to run when you're running grunt. It's going to define different targets for different tasks. So you can have um, a task to do something to a production environment and a task to do something into a development environment. And you can actually target those tasks individually uh, when you're running Grunt. And lastly, it loads your plugins. So that's an important part because Grunt runs off of plugins. So here's a sample. Uh, first line module.exports equals function Grunt. That's just telling Node to give me a local copy of Grunt and pass it into this function here. And then the Grunt.init config file on line two there, uh, that is how we initialize the configuration of Grunt. You just pass in an object to that. So here we have a task called uglify with a target of all. After that, we are going to pass in some files to uglify. Um, this particular one, we're using a, a specific format of files. And I'll actually talk about these formats in a little bit. Um, but here we're going to have an output file of scode-min.js. And we're going to take two files, scode.js and scodepage.js, and uglify them into that one file. The next task here is called jasmine. So that means we're going to run some unit tests with it. Uh, and we have a target called min. So that means we're going to run uh, our jasmine tests on the minified code. So our source here points to our scode-min file. And then we're going to pass in some options. So each plugin has its own particular options. Uh, this Jasmine plugin um, has an options of specs, and that's to point uh, Jasmine to our spec files. And then the last two lines here are actually where we load those tasks. So the grunt.load npm tasks is going to go ahead and load those plugins for you. So the Godify and Jasmine plugins uh, need to be loaded for this grunt config to actually run. So let's go over this uh, a little bit more. So the first step in creating, creating your grunt file.js is to bootstrap that file. And you do that by creating your module.exports function, uh, creating your grunt.init config function call, passing in an object with tasks, and then loading your tasks with the grunt.load npm tasks function. So when you talk about tasks, um, each task itself is an individual property on that configuration object. Uh, and the property name of each task is the name of the plugin. So if you think of that previous uh, slide, we had a task called Uglify and a task called Jasmine. 
and those are the two plugins we were loading. So here we're just going to create another uh, run init config. We're going to pass in an object uh, with an uglify task, a jasmine task, and a jsn task. So those have to match the names of the plugins, otherwise run's going to error out on you. So when we talk about tasks, um, we also talk about targets. And this is kind of a point of confusion for some people um, because it's actually assumed that you know about these targets when you read the documentation of a lot of plugins. So each task itself can have one or more targets. And these next two bullet points are where a lot of people get caught up. I've gotten caught up. And that some tasks won't work without targets defined. So you need to have a target of min or whatever you call it for that task to run. And some tasks actually won't work with targets. So if you have a target defined, the task is going to fail. And the only way to really figure this out is a lot, a lot of times by trial and error um, because the documentation on the plugins isn't always really great. So when we talk about targets, uh, there are actually sub-properties of your uh, plugin task. So here we have a task for uglifying our JavaScript. It has two targets, dev and prof. And when you run run, you can actually run one of these targets alone, or you can run them all at the same time. So each task itself uh, takes a configuration. And one of the most important parts of any target's configuration is the files you pass in. Uh, most tasks in Grunt use input and output files. It's a very common pattern, so it's built right into the Grunt system. Um, there's a lot of different ways to actually pass tasks or files into tasks. And it's important to choose the right one. Um, if you're not choosing the right type of way to push files into a task, it's actually going to cause you a lot of problems. You're going to end up stressing yourself out. So um, it's important to choose the right type of file input uh, when you're creating these tasks. And this last one that I highlight here is most plugins assume you know how to configure tasks. So they leave this part out of their documentation. Um, so if you're reading a task or a task's documentation or a plugin's documentation, and you don't really know about configuring files, you're going to just tear your hair out trying to figure out you know, how to get this plugin to work. So it's really important that you understand how files work before you actually go and start configuring and installing plugins. So the first file format is called compact format. And this, is, this uses uh, two properties. One is called SRC, and the other one's called a DEST for source and destination. So here we have a concat task with a target called prod. And the, our source files is actually going to be an array of files. So here we have an array of, of bb.js and bbb.js. And our destination file is um, b.js. So whatever task we run is going to take both of those inputs and just create one output. The second uh, type of file is the file input is the files object format. So this uses an object named files. And the property name of that object is the output file name. And the value of the property is the input files. So here we have that same uglify prod task, and we're passing in a files object. And here we're doing uh, two different files. The first one is going to have a destination of a.js, and we're going to pass it in an array of objects. So we're going to get two objects there, aa.js and aaa.js. And the second one, we're just going to do a one-to-one. -one. So um, ai.a1.js is going to get compiled from aaa1.js. So the important take-home take here is that the left-hand side is the output file. The right-hand side is your input files. Now, the last one is the files array format. And this one is actually going to support multiple source and destination mappings per target. So if you have files that live in different directories or you know, different projects even, you can actually uh, specify them into Grunt using this files array format. And it's the exact same concept as the other ones. Uh, we have a files here, but instead of it being a JavaScript object, it's a JavaScript array of JavaScript objects. So that inside these uh, objects we're passing into this array, we can use the source and destination format. Uh, just like we did before, so the source is going to be an array, and our destination is going to be a uh, string. So this, with the source and destination, you can only have a single output file, um, but you can have as many input files as you want. 
Um, so another important concept when you're displaying, when you're selecting files, is actually filtering files. So both the compact and array file formats, and that means the ones that have source and destination properties, also support additional options to be passed in there. Um, and one is filtering files. So the option, the property of filter, is actually going to take a function that returns a Boolean value for each file passed into it, or a node fs.stats method name. So an example of using the filter function, uh, here we just have our, our files array format. Uh, we're going to use a source and a destination. And then for the filter property, we're going to pass in a function. And it's going to take a single argument. And that's going to be the name of each file uh, that gets passed into this, each file that you specified in your source. And we're just going to say return whether it's node modules or not, uh, pass it the test function, which is going to return a Boolean or not against the source. So basically, we're ignoring anything that's in the node modules directory for that entire directory. And so the other way you can do a filter is using FS stats. Same concept, uh, files array, source, a destination, and a filter. And basically, the is file is an FS.stats function. Uh, I pass it as a string. It's only going to um, include files that FS.stats is file uh, returns true against. So another thing you can do in your package.json is um, read from your package. In your grunt file.js is read from your package.json file. So here we have our grunt init config, and we're going to create a property called package. And we're going to read into uh, our package.json by using grunt.file.readjson. And what's nice is uh, when you do that, grunt will actually let you interpolate these strings into any of your string properties. So here we're actually going to create an output file of scode.min with the package.version number specified in our package.json. So it's a good way to decouple properties um, from your front file.js and your package. So things like um, your project name are useful in here uh, and your version numbers as well, especially when you're creating uh, minified files. So that brings us to actually running tasks, right? You installed Grunt. We have all these tasks. Now we need to run them and do something with them. So tasks are run with the grunt command. Um, and just specifying grunt with no um, options after it is going to run every task and every target inside of your grunt file.js. So if you want to run everything, just type in grunt, hit enter, and you're done. So if we have an init config here with uglify uh, with two targets of dev and prod and a cat with a target of dev, grunt is going to run all of that. So if you run a single task, it is a, it's done by adding the task name after the grunt command. And this will actually run every single target for that task. So here, if we run grunt uglify, we're going to run the uglify task with the dev and prod targets. So it's going to run both of those if we just type in run uglify. So the last way is to actually run a single target for a single task. And to do this, we would do grunt uglify colon dev. And that's only going to run our dev target of our uglify task. So this is real helpful when you're trying to run different tasks for different environments. You know, if you want to combine and minify only for your production environment, you can target it like uh, with a uh, grunt command and a task target. So the other thing you can do is actually create custom targets. So what this is going to do is actually run specific tasks and specific targets in a specific order. So if you don't want to, if you want to run it as a group of commands and different targets, you can actually create a custom target. And it's done with the register task function. Um, so register task is usually done, that's actually done, um, at the end of your module.exports function. So here is a custom default target. And what we're going to do is um, run only these three tasks here when grunt is run with no targets. So if you want to change your default task when you type in grunt without any targets, you could create a task of default and tell it to only run specific tasks. Um, here's another um, register task. And we're just going to say, let's only target our prod targets. So we're going to say grunt.registerTask, name it prod. And then we can just pass in our task names that target prod. 
And then we run grunt, we would just type in grunt prod, and it's going to run uh, these tasks and only our targets that we specify. Another neat thing and useful thing you can do with grunt is you can pass objects into it. So let's say we wanted to dynamically create um, an environment variable uh, when we run the grunt file. So you do that by calling grunt with a dash dash variable name equals value. So here's an example of how you could use that. So here we have a variable called environment that's going to call the grunt.option function, and we're going to pass it in env. So that's going to actually look for a parameter called env when we run grunt. And that's going to, that env variable is going to be set to whatever that's equal to. And here we have just a couple of tasks, so Jasmine, the cat, Uglify, same tasks that were in our other example. And then we can say grunt.register task default. Now all we're going to do is take each of those task names uh, and map them and just append the environment variable to them. So if we run grunt dash dash env equals prod, we're actually going to get jasmine prod and cat prod and uglify prod. So you can do the same thing uh, like with the development environment or anything. So it's a really easy way to target specific environments and run specific tasks. So a couple other tips and tricks uh, that I've learned from using grunt. The first one is it's just JavaScript, right? So you can actually create helper functions inside of that um, module that exports function. And you want to DRY your, DRY your code, right? So you don't want to create repetitive code. So if you have the same list of files you're passing into a bunch of different targets, create a variable for them and just use that variable um, to access all of those files. Um, if you have functions that you want to pass into multiple filter commands or something, just use a name function inside of that module that exports and uh, you refer to it a function instead of actually creating that anonymous function every time. The second one is dynamically load your plugins. So if you have seven or eight plugins for a project, you don't want to have to keep typing load npm tasks for every single plugin. Um, that way when you add plugins, you have to modify it. It just makes your grunt file a little bit more brittle. Um, so thanks to Trek, the guy that was uh, here a couple months ago, last month, um, I learned this little trick. So the first thing you have to do is install the match dependency plugin, which is um, npm install match dep. Then instead of each um, grunt.load npm tasks with your plugin test name, you can just do this line right here. So you're going to say require match dep, which is going to pull in um, your match dep plugin. Then you can say filter dev with a grunt dash star. And you can do this because every single grunt plugin starts with the name grunt dash. So grunt dash jasmine, grunt dash uglify, those all start with grunt dash. So then all you got to do is loop through that array, that filter dev calls, and you can call grunt.load npm tasks on it. So now you're actually going to dynamically load your plugins. You're going to remove plugins, add plugins, and you're never going to forget to load them uh, ever again. And the last suggestion is read and reread the configuring tasks section on the grunt website. And a lot of people I've run into that have problems with grunt the problems are really simply solved by just running, re reading that section on the grunt website. Again, all the plugins just assume you know it, so they're not going to actually tell you how to do things like configuring tasks and passing in files. So if you're well known with that um, configuring task section of the website, you probably won't have a whole lot of problems running grunt. So that's um, all I have to say about grunt. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? When you're uh, configuring the tasks, say you set your source file, like the input, mm -hmm. can you just um, give like a directory path instead of every single file path? Um, yes, so you can use um, like node pathing, so you could do like star star directory name star to get every file in that directory and all of its subdirectories. Um, and there's some really good examples of that actually on the um, registering tasks or the configuring tasks as part of the ground website. Yeah, you don't have to specify specific files. You can actually do that and things so like that as well. You, then you could filter. You can filter. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So you can pass in the filter function as well. Are the target the or the, the, the target like input output file structures interchangeable? Um, you had the example of just input output um, kind of array or an object or an array of objects like. Does each right. plugin understand? Each yeah, each plugin always understands all of the input files. That's baked right into Grunt. So it's actually a Grunt thing and not a plugin thing. So they all understand all the input file formats. 
for the current watch thing, I've actually just run across that today, but I haven't uh, used that yet. Yes. Uh, let's say I'm using SAS, uh, which I think use. Yes. And uh, you change one of your SAS files. Does that actually run the entire SAS process for the movie? Yeah, it's going to run that entire task. So whatever you have specified for that task, it's going to run the whole task. Now, the watch plugin will tell you the file change. It'll say, you know, I saw this file change. I'm going to run these tasks. But it's going to run the entire task. Gotcha. Okay. So if that task actually just kicks off the Ruby process, then yep. do the SAS calculation. Yes. So the SAS, the SAS plugin actually requires Ruby. So then that would just run that process every time you change the file? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yes. Can you call the from the root folder, so if I had a, a subfolder come in, folder ahead of it, and say, like, run subfolder? Um, I'm not sure if you could do that. Grunt will run from any folder because the grunt CLI is a global command, but it's going to look for a grunt file yeah, in that folder. So I don't know if you can specify a location for your grunt file. I would imagine it's like the it. Yeah, I've never run into that since I've never actually tried to do that. You can actually just require Grunt to call a function CLI and it will do whatever it wants to do. So we have the same problem with like our builds where we can't install these as a user, so you have to find a way to pull from the memory. There's just a CLI function on it. So you have to talk to that. Thank you. All right, so um, if you're first time users or want to see me for a sticker, I'm going to be more than happy to give them out. Um, so this is the end of my presentation, and obviously it's the end of my run uh, at Wonky JS. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then this is a link to the presentation. Online. <laughs> Next up, we've got. Uh, uh, so we got some intermission first because I got to do some technical stuff to get this working. But and we did not coordinate. This is just a very. This is yeah, so we do have uh, we may do another run of Walking Tech shirts, but Walking Tech is a initiative to, that I have been saying I was going to do for a while, and I still want to, uh, to help organize all the meetup organizers for all the tech meetups in the city. And Walking has a lot of meetups, and there's a lot of people who build these things. And continuing education is a big thing. Um, that's why we're going to do our own and one of us covered. So. Yeah, I'll probably talk about, um, a bit more about that, but sorry. be sure it's also nice. Yeah. Oh, and one more thing before we can move on to Paul. Um, our presenter for next month uh, has run into some extenuating circumstances, and they will not be able to present. So we are looking for someone to fill their shoes. So if you have anything you want to talk about, preferably JavaScript unit testing, come see me. Um, <laughs> or if it's anything else, it doesn't matter. We'll take any kind of fill-in. but. We could also do like a fire talk thing like we just did today, where it's like a half hour of two different presentations, so we don't have to fill up an hour. So, something to think about. Like talks for five minutes. Or beer. Beer works in that. That's all that part of Drink. Alright, um, so we have five minutes, and we'll try to get this working. Yeah. Yes. I wouldn't need your help because that is actually nice. I mean, because, like, yeah, I don't know what his format is. It is format. It is format. Yeah, you just have some files in this whole thing. I
Did you say it's going to shake down? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, you know, like, you know, 
Sanchez or at Basic Days everywhere online. And um, you guys are awesome. So, <laughs> uh, let's see. So, this is actually just a, a some meta talk. This is actually a presentation built on Impress.js. So, this is a JavaScript competitor ish to Prezi, if you've heard of Prezi. And Strut, if you ever want to do these kind of presentations, is a builder for cross presentations. It's an open source, super experimental stuff. So if you want to go crazy stuff, uh, look at Impress. It's interesting stuff. 
So uh, this presentation, I want to cover some intermediate advanced patterns that I have used in vanilla JavaScript. So this stuff is covering vanilla JavaScript. Uh, I have, I'm a consultant, a freelance consultant, and I have had uh, inherited some code in the past of very experienced developers who are not doing uh, or are unfamiliar with JavaScript software engineering practices. And some of the stuff that I'm going to be covering today is some entry level stuff. Out of curiosity, what, as far as JavaScript goes, uh, who would consider themselves like beginners? Uh, intermediate? <laughs> Super advanced ninjas? <laughs> we got, I saw them. <laughs> Actually, no, I did not see them. Sorry. So, this presentation is actually a distillation of a series of Douglas Crawford videos that span about eight hours. And I have tried to assemble the good parts into a half hour. The good parts and the good parts. Exactly. So, uh, if you don't know Douglas Crawford, I definitely look him up. He is a very intelligent, opinionated man. Uh, he has conceptualized JSON. He did uh, the first part of JS Glimpse process. He is sometimes known as uh, the JavaScript guru. There's a lot of people who either like him or hate him. It's crazy. Right. And he also wrote the JavaScript group uh, If you'd like, I have a link to his videos if you ever want to look at it. Again, it's like eight hours, so I just kind of chill for a week and then watch a lot of it. some good stuff. And uh, like I said, this won't be covering the DOM or anything about the DOM, but this is standard JavaScript practices that should help you write better code if you interact with the DOM. Uh, so with that, let's move on. So let's see. The things I want to cover are, uh, like, where did the JavaScript come from? Uh, you know, what should I be thinking about when I'm writing JavaScript compared to other uh, languages, such as Java, uh, such as Python, or Ruby, or PHP, or so on. And uh, you know, like, what are actually JavaScript objects compared to other ones? And, you know, some three very simple, I think, uh, concepts to help organize your code so that when you're writing your code in a team of 10 people, or if you happen to be writing WordPress plugins where you have 15 other developers writing completely different application plugins and then you start collaborating each other's functions, how do you prevent that? How do you become a good neighborhood citizen when you're writing JavaScript? Uh, so, with that, I just want to cover some of the uh, influences of JavaScript. So, of course, JavaScript is very similar to Java syntax. You've got the braces, you've got the constructors, you've got your uh, very similar API type functions. Uh, but we also have some very interesting ways on how functions work that actually came from a language called Scheme. Scheme is a very functional language. I haven't taught myself Scheme yet, uh, but if you ever want to get into functional stuff, since JavaScript has a huge influence from Scheme, uh, you can do a lot of stuff in JavaScript, especially, I think, ES6, the next stuff that we want is more functional stuff coming up. The prototype system is, actually comes from a language called Self. I actually was bored one weekend and taught myself Self. So it's a very alien world when it comes to languages. It's actually, Self is the first one that did prototypes versus classics. And classes were formulated back in 1967, and prototypes were developed 20 years after that. So the idea of prototypes is newer than classes, and JavaScript is one of the probably most popular prototypical language out there compared to classical languages that everyone is taught, which is confusing because people try to do classical patterns in a prototypical language. And if you're doing vanilla JavaScript, uh, that gets confusing. And of course, the last one, which I found kind of amusing when I found this out, hypercard. Hypercard was this old app of thing to make objects dynamic, so that you could have very visual <laughs> objects on the screen, and you can interact with scripts, such as on click, on hover, just probably self uh, And what happened was Netscape back in '95 wanted to do the same thing on the internet, so they hired a dude called Brennan Knight, super awesome dude who came up with JavaScript, wanted to do a scheme interpreter, and do Java. It's this whole some Netscape political battle. 
to. But we ended up with JavaScript in two weeks. Just think about that. <laughs> <laughs> so the state of JavaScript ES1, ES being ECMAScript, that's the standard name for JavaScript. ES1 was standardized in 97. However, LiaScript for JavaScript was made in 95 for Netscape 2. Uh, the ECMAScript committee, ECMA being the committee that I guess standardized it. Uh, first one, 97, 98, uh, they changed the stuff, 99. They added like regex and stuff like that too. Uh, and ES3 is the one that we all know and love that we probably, for some of us, is the only one we've worked with our entire career. And then ES4 was this grand scheme of awesome stuff that politically never happened, so to scratch. And then we got ES5, which is standardized for uh, which is actually found in some current browsers. And then ES6 is in draft mode. In the community, and if you ever want to look at what's coming up, there's a mailing list out there called ES Discuss. Uh, I'm a part of that. You get bombarded for emails every day, and they talk about complain about new features in ES6. It's actually kind of interesting. Uh, even Brennan likes on that, and it's probably a little smart people. And actually, some of the ES6 draft stuff can be found in the WinMesh browser, so if you run like the daily build in Node.js, which runs the Google V8 engine, you can actually use like generators and other stuff. Like that's awesome. That's kind of cool stuff. Right? All right, so what should I be thinking about when I'm writing JavaScript? Uh, very simple software engineering principles, coupling and cohesion. Uh, coupling and cohesion are, you know, what you should be thinking of whenever you're writing maintainable software. And JavaScript makes it different than your classical development that you have done from school in Java and PHP or O or any other classical languages. So, of course, let's see. Now we have coupling, which is simply if you have an object over here and an object over here, and this changes and it highly impacts this one over here, that's high coupling. And that's bad maintenance. And then you have cohesion, where if you have a whole bunch of stuff in one class or object or module or something, and if they have nothing to do with each other, uh, then it's low cohesion, which is also hard to maintain and hard to understand. Code. If you've ever inherited a JavaScript file with 5,000 lines, which is just functions and variable levels and stuff, that's very high coupling and very low cohesion, and just don't touch that code because it's good. All right, simple primary objects. Objects are a bit different than what you may expect in other languages. Uh, unlike other things which are directly uh, tied to types or various other things in the language, like class or other metadata, an object in JavaScript is super simple. All it is is a, a key value here. Uh, you can also think of it as a hash or a dictionary or anything like that. And there's three operations you can do in objects. Uh, you can Get set and delete. Here we go. All right, so we have a, a problem. Uh, all variables and functions are global by default, and this will ruin your friends in your neighborhood. Because if you define a clone function, and then you import someone else's code that also defines a clone function, and all of a sudden your code that expects your stuff is cloned, good luck debugging that. Solution is, of course, let's, uh, since we're with that language, we can use objects. Now, uh, keep in mind this is ES3 ish. Uh, there's some new stuff that's happening, uh, such as CommonJS or AMD, some other enterprising stuff. Uh, but keep it simple, we can just use objects. And this is what a lot of stuff uses right now. Uh, so you can put your values and functions and objects into what are called namespaces, and we can create these namespaces with objects. I'm going to try to right click. I'm not an Apple user. Uh, okay, is it control or function or option to plus? Uh, Apple people? Yes, if so I just expand. Yes. Command? Command plus? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so here is a very, very simple example on how to uh, use the spaces. Can you guys see this code? Fantastic. Uh, okay, so we have up top here uh, 
let's assume we're writing WordPress code, and so we have the WordPress namespace. So the first thing you got to do is to make sure that WordPress exists. So what we can do is, this is a kind of clever thing in JavaScript. This logical or here will return from that expression, from this expression, the first non-falsy object. So if WordPress is undefined or null, it's going to move on to the second one, which will give us a new blank object. And assign that to the global WordPress version. Uh, you're going to see that all over the place in code amongst all the libraries that you do. So using this for operator as a give me the first non-falsy object is a very powerful false And the next thing we're going to do is expand the namespace into wp.gallery and the same thing. Uh, if gallery is not set yet, get a new blank object assigned to that namespace. The next thing we do is let's start chucking some of our, our API onto this namespace. So we construct wp.env, set it to production. Uh, we set the do it property on wp because all wp is an object, and object is just a key value pair. So the do it property or key that we assign the function, it's just one key. The gallery.bindView is another function that we assign to it, uh, and it's just by gallery. So let's run this. So if we do WP, it gives us everything under that namespace, which is a gallery and the env. So if we do wp.env, it brings us back to production. We do wp.doit and invoke it. We get that console and runs that function. Uh, gallery.mindv. And it runs that function. So that's something that you can do in your enterprise or company or plug-in or whatever, make your namespace, and just start chucking stuff onto that. Uh, don't just clutter the global namespace. People will not like you. All right. Any questions on the name? Sit the namespace. Cool. All right. The next thing up is modules, or how do you actually now separate your 50,000 live file into separate files, and how do you not interact with each other? Because in Java or PHP or C Sharp or whatever, you have a crack of files and you import stuff and all this other stuff. And standard ECMAScript 3 uh, code on the browser that you can find on, on IE6, uh, there's a very powerful thing because since JavaScript is influenced by uh, Scheme, it's a functional language or it has functional qualities. And they, functional languages have things called closures. It's kind of a new thing if someone has not done functional stuff, but it's a very common practice in good uh, JavaScript code. All it really is is if you have a var on the, uh, the first line of your code, it's going to be global uh, scope. But any vars that are declared in the function are going to be function scope and are not going to be super global namespace. And what we can do is we can use that to our advantage and actually use functions to enclose our variables that we don't want to leave outside and have that also interact with the global namespaces. I'll show you some examples on this to see. So the first thing we want to do is declare the first uh, root namespace. Um, we want to do that because, uh, especially in enterprise uh, situations, you're going to concatenate all your files together and may or may not know which one comes first. So of our food, if it is uh, the first thing that's out there, it's going to make it from undefined to just one or something. I, I don't exactly know, but you got to do that. Otherwise, again, you can assign to it. All right. The next thing we, we need to do is this function closure to wrap up our logic in a module. So you may have seen this pattern in various of the locations. First thing we do is we wrap in parentheses. We make the, what's called a anonymous function. We chuck everything that we want to have in a module inside of that thing. And at the end of that module, we just uh, have these uh, parentheses here. 
and we close that <laughs> function uh, expression. So the function logic is all of that. That in and of itself doesn't do anything because it's an anonymous function and you can't reference it. By invoking that function, it will run that function once the interpreter gets that line. And it will run whatever codes inside that thing, and that's it. And you have no reference to that function anymore. But it's still in memory. So what we did here, the first thing we did was we tried to assemble the boot namespace. If food has been defined, we chuck that into the local food variable. Otherwise, we go to empty object. And then we assign our API to that boot space. Boot cut span equals a namespace. In a separate file, pretend this is a separate file, we do the exact same thing. We uh, define the food global variable, and then we uh, shake, uh, take the global food variable. If it's defined, chuck that into the food variable, otherwise, make an empty object. And then we make a var sandwich. Now, this sandwich here is a function scoped variable. So this is not accessible in global scope. And we are able to use this variable within our module or within the closure. So on this food, because food is a global namespace object, we assign a function to the property, water or food. And the value of water or food is this function. And we can either access the locally scoped variable here sandwich, or we could access globally scoped namespace itself called food namespace. And again, we automatically invoke it, runs that code, closure is created, and it's in memory. So we run that. Notice there's no output. But if we do food, we get our API for food, spam, and blog about food, blog about food being a function. So if we go ahead and import that, we get the actual values of sandwich and food as fair. Now, if, we, if I was to type and try to reference sandwich, it's, it's not, it doesn't exist on global scope. It's enclosed within that function. So this is a very, uh, very cool, very easy way to be able to localize your file and your logic so that it doesn't start bleeding into everything else. And kind of gives you a private state. Questions about uh, closures and modules? Can you get into the closure anyway? Uh, can't get into the closure. So if it's in memory? There is a ninja ish way to do it. It depends. Uh, on older ones, if you do like arguments variable, you may, I think you may be able to do like arguments that call you or something. Um, if you, there's a thing called use strict, which would prevent that from being accessible, so that could be uh, accessible use strict is. Uh, I haven't tested this, so I may be wrong, but I believe that's, that, that's my assumption how that would work. It should prevent that kind of security risk. Any other questions? Or any corrections? Okay. Yeah, I would highly recommend you looking at the strict. It's pretty, like, all I would do here, actually. I would have a use strict at the beginning of all its closures. Yeah, I left it out because I thought it was out of scope for this discussion. But yeah, if you wanted to use use strict, you could just put it inside each of these closures. And this encapsulates your logic. And that logic, if it's running a modern browser, will always be a strict. What does use strict do? Sorry. So ES5, if you remember that the, the standards that have been created, ES5 created a uh, thing called script. And what that does is that will tell the JavaScript interpreter to actually take out either uh, hard to optimize code, such as with, or it will also change the way this works, and it will change so that this, this no longer references the global namespace. And removes like color and call on arguments. It pretty much does carry an optimization rules of the JavaScript stuff, which you shouldn't be doing anyways. Uh, I would have highly recommend looking at the strip, but if you ever want to use the strip, that's all you have to do. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
You just put the string right in that function. Yeah. yeah. And then if you, in this case, if you were to remove the var from var sandwich equals pbj, that wouldn't pass anymore because you're just implicitly declaring it global. Right. Right. And it so also that's helps. the big thing. It'll catch where you. It'll help you keep yourself from really leaking. That's the, that's another good point. There's a lot of things where in ES3 it would just fail silently, and ES5 actually fails with an error. So okay. during testing, it makes it a lot easier to catch these hard to reach errors. I use Ustrip and all this stuff. And all that happens on the old, older processes is they don't support script code. Um, it just involves that one. Any other questions on that stuff? Cool. All right. Third up is prototypes. Oh, well, ideas are renowned to be tough or misunderstood in JavaScript. And there are actually no first class classes in JavaScript. But I want to write code in old style with inheritance. It is, can either be easy or hard. Uh, there are a bunch of libraries out there to help people write classes in a class uh, pattern for MLA classes. Uh, but <laughs> since prototypes, JavaScript is a very prototypical language, you can write classes in, in, uh, in JavaScript. It's, it's a bit wonky. OK. So I have two parts to this. Live code is the ES3 style prototypical things that we all know and hate. And experimental is something I'm working on. Uh, I, I'll show it to you guys. I have no promises that this works today. Um, <laughs> and I have some of this stuff in GitHub if you want to take a look at it. So live code using ES3 constructor functions and prototypes. Oh, OK, so we have same stuff. We have the food next space that we pull in to make sure that it's referenceable. Um, we have a module that we or closure that we create. And we uh, assemble the, the, the food name space. And now we want to construct our API that will be reasonable to other developers or plugin developers and yourself. And the first thing we want to do is uh, create what's known as a constructor function. Because technically, all functions can be used as constructors, but if you actually intend it, uh, to actually make a type, um, by convention, what a lot of people do and what a lot of Linux systems do is ensure that any functions that are intended to be used as constructors start with a capitalized letter. So that when you call this function, all it is is a function, you make sure to always remember to write new in front of it. So what we, what we want inside the constructor function is to assign all instance variables to that object. So when you do uh, food.meal1, sorry, new food.meal1, it will create a new object. It will pass to this function. This is going to reference that this variable is going to reference that new object, and then it's just going to pass through and assign spam to that. Now we want to assemble the standard API on the meal one type. So since all functions are also objects, functions as all objects can have key value pairs, one of which is defined as the property named prototype, uh, the, which is kind of meta exploding in some people's minds, but once you uh, grasp how this works, it kind of makes sense. So anything on this prototype, which is an object, is going to be referenceable uh, when you do new mail one. And that object is actually going to inherit from this object, whatever this object is. Um, actually, I think I skipped. Uh, just a quick reference of what's sometimes called the prototypical chain. So if you call a property of an object and that property doesn't have it, each object has a inherited object, which is known as its prototype. So if um, we have class B, which inherits from class A, in class B we call eat on B, and it doesn't have it, it's going to look at A. If A has it, then it invokes that function. So we're, what we're doing here is the same thing. And that's always used by these prototype objects. So we have prototype.e. 
and that's a function. So we just do console.log eating, and then we reference since it's a method. Uh, this is that object, this.span, which will be whatever uh, this value is. You can change it also after you create a new object. So if we do inheritance, this is where it gets weird. Uh, okay, so we just create a new constructor function. And if you want to chain your constructors, uh, your Java style is not straightforward. And this is how you would do it if you want to. You just reference the initial constructor function, do a dot line, test the uh, instance of the object, pass the arguments if you want to. And it's actually going to be, if you do new foo.nail2, it's going to create a new object, pass it to the nail2 constructor function. The first thing it does is it now passes it to the nail1 constructor function, runs through that, sounds spam, comes back to here. And then we want to change or set additional metadata or instance data, sorry, and we're able to do that after this. So that's the instance data. The next thing we want to do is uh, now inherit from the meal one type. So you do food.meal2.prototype, which is going to be what object you inherited from whenever you do new meal. And you assign that in this wonky object.create method, which creates a new object that inherits the meal one type, uh, prototype rather. And then you can assign, if you ever want to use the instance of operator, you can now, you have to now set the instructor property of your prototype to be able you know, to instruct the function. Okay, so that's how you do crazy inheritance using ES3 style JavaScript prototyping system. Now if you want to use it, then you now are in a separate file, you want to use your API, uh, new food.meal1, new field, uh, food.meal2, you can uh, call your launch.e or the internet of these instances which will pass through this prototype system and then involve with the instance data and the API. So if you remember launch study, we assigned E to that meal one's prototype and we assigned span to the instance. So we do E. Here, and it's going to call this.span on the instance, and it's going to re reference that in console value. Same thing with meal2. Now, we didn't have a e method on the meal2's prototype, so it's going to look at its, up its prototype chain, finds meal1, looks if it has the e property, it looks that, and it will now use the instance variables from meal2's instance. So if we run this, we get the spam and eggs, and then the email two is going to be the spam seven spam eggs. Okay, so that's ES three types. Uh, uh, if you if you want, I mean that's the URL if you ever want to reference this stuff and look at an example. Uh, Ryan did a blog post about this, uh, and I think it's pretty well written, um, which he points out I was writing this at the same time actually. Um, and I corrected myself on some stuff. So thank you. But this is how you do full type systems in ES3 JavaScript problems. ES6 has a new class operator that you can use, but that's going to be a long ways before you can use it in all production browsers. So, questions on this? Again, I, if you want to look at this some more, uh, grab that URL and take a look at it for yourself. It's actually not all that much code. I mean, looking at it at a normal size, that's as much code as you have to create some types. All right, so that is the tried and true way to do uh, prototyping in, or class typing in JavaScript. This is, I feel, very controversial on how I'd rather do prototypes, but um, this is what I like doing. Okay, so I wrote 
some uh, stuff here. Don't mind my phone function. Don't look at it. Don't look at it. <laughs> don't look at it. There's a whole bunch of clone functions out there. You just need a clone function. <laughs> uh, I think jQuery.clone works too. Uh, if you just do uh, find anything that is able to do a deep clone of a, a function, uh, sorry, not this, that's all you need to do this way. So, hopefully this stuff works. So, okay, we have, again, our module up here where we want to set the API. We pull in the demo. We make our first object. Notice now we have no constructor functions. And we set up all the properties on this, this first object. So it's vanity, same stuff from the previous one. Still an object, good form, uh, methods. We create a new mail2 object that creates. So that creates a new object with its prototype being um, mail1. We set it to be dot span and we change it again. So the difference here is using a prototypical system, we literally set up a fully functional prototype on the system versus a type with constructors and dot prototypes and dot constructors as well as garbage. I could use mail1 and mail2 in production. Uh, the intended purpose of this API, though, is you want to grab an instance or a clone of mail1 and mail2 and change it to meet your needs. So the same thing down here. So instead of new, which is a very classical operator, who's clone. So var lunch equals a clone of demo.mail1. Var dinner, clone of meal2. And a clone of, again, meal2 to make a snack. And I want to change the snack a bit. So we set a span property PBNJ. So we now have our instances. We use the same. Uh, API that is as functional as the other one with like 75% of lines of code. And we're able to use it uh, like we did before. And if you notice, by changing Snack, it didn't actually impact Mail 2, so all the stuff still works. We can change it as we need it, and we're able to do this in JavaScript. This is a prototypical system. If you look online about this stuff, you're not going to find too many people talking about this. It seems people really want their construct functions or running class functions to help you make classes and types. Uh, I like this style more because it's vanilla JavaScript and it uses it for a prototypical system to make your API. If you want this clone function, I actually have it out in GitHub, NPM, and components. Uh, just look at basic data slash clone. Uh, otherwise, it's, there's 50,000 clone functions out there. Um, Questions about this style of prototypical inheritance versus the other one? All right. Where did you say you get that clone function? On GitHub, the clone, like the stuff I told you not to look at, unless you really want to. It's some gnarly and ES5 stuff. Uh, you can find it on GitHub under my name, basic days, slash clone. So that's all the code there. I haven't tested it fully. It's super experimental stuff. But if you want to take a look at it, uh, feel free. I accept feedback or requests or complaints or whatever. So uh, this is open source. It's an MIT license. You know what they're doing. So clone is essentially doing a deep copy. So okay, in that object. instance, you have a deep copy of its prototype and returning back a new object with that prototype, right? Yeah. Yep. Because all the prototype is is obvious chaining objects. That's all the prototype is. Uh, the ES3 way of doing things is very Java-esque and trying to do a Java syntax in a prototype language. Um, itself, this is actually what they do. They set up fully functional objects and they clone it to make new stuff. Um, when I read this, it was kind of I don't know, but it's it's interesting. Now, is this similar to how? Frameworks like Backbone deal with like. What most of the systems that you find out there in the wild and in production, uh, they actually write functions to emulate classes. So you are writing types without knowing that you're actually using prototypes underneath it. So those work too. Really, it kind of depends on your style and what you want to do and how crazy and insane you want to do. 
Uh, I find that this works too, but again, it's experimental. Uh, in addition, ES6 is making classes, class syntax a lot clearer than what we saw before this, but it's still on the line doing the exact same thing to start the question right now. I like this one too. And he uses all the words. Good questions? All right. So those are the three things that I wanted to cover, namespace and modules and prototypes to help you uh, do coupling and cohesion the JavaScript way, which is very different from what you may have been taught or experienced in other languages. But with the upcoming ES6 stuff and with the node uh, environments and all this other crazy stuff, there's going to be some pretty interesting stuff I think happening uh, in the JavaScript. Uh, environment. And I think it's going to be pretty exciting. So feel free to experiment or talk to just the next like myself and others in school. So, thanks. Is there a link to that presentation? Or? What I got to do with this presentation is I got to post it someplace. Okay. Uh, it, Impress is a very experimental. Presentation framework that oh. does some cool stuff. I gotta figure out what to do. Right now. Yeah, this one also I can post on YouTube. Uh, basic days, is that your Yes. I have some stuff on there that's not too long. Any other questions or anything? Cool. I'll be grabbing a beer, so I'll be sticking off a bit. Uh, but definitely, thanks guys for coming in. And if you guys want to talk at uh, future meetups, we're always looking for volunteers. Um, I think you guys are pretty nice, so it's pretty easy to present in, in this meetup. So I, I wouldn't worry about notice this or anything like that. If you need help, uh, talk to me or Dustin, who was able to make it today as the other organizer. And uh, again, thanks, Ryan, for helping out in the last few months. And good luck at Netflix. Thanks, guys. Mm-hmm.